go for lunch. Looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket awaiting liftoff from Vandenberg Space Force Base, California, in just 14 minutes from now. Tonight's mission marks space, SpaceX's 296th overall launch, but our first of 2024, and we're excited to kick off an even more exciting year. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Tice, Senior Quality Systems Engineering Manager here at SpaceX. And I'm Jesse Anderson, a Manufacturing Engineering Manager, and we will be your host for today's launch of 15 Starlink V2 Minis that will add to our growing constellation, providing reliable, high-speed internet around the world. To date, Starlink has completed more than 100 launches, putting more than 5,000 satellites in orbit. But today's Starlink launch is a little bit different. In addition to our standard broadband satellites, we're also launching six of our first ever direct-to-cell satellites capable of connecting directly to your cell phone. This is really cool, and we'll be talking about it more later in the show. It's hard to believe that it was just three years ago when Starlink launched the Better Than Nothing beta service for our first paying customers in the United States. And today, Starlink is providing high-speed, low-latency internet to more than 2.3 million households and organizations in over 70 countries and many markets around the world, spanning all seven continents and oceans. And what's really cool is Starlink is now delivers service to more customers than any other satellite internet service provider in the world. As you can see from these photos featured on stories.starlink.com, Starlink is able to quickly deploy to locations where quality internet access has been unreliable or completely unavailable. And so many people in the hardest to reach areas of the world are now getting online, some for the first time ever. This means critical access to resources we often take for granted, like virtual healthcare and education. If you're using Starlink in a unique or interesting way, be sure to share your story with us at stories.starlink.com. As I mentioned earlier, today we're taking Starlink a step further with the launch of our first ever satellites capable of enabling cell phone service. It's called Direct to Cell, and through partnerships with wireless providers like T-Mobile here in the US, you'll be able to connect using your existing cell phone, even in places that are typically out of range. Connectivity nearly everywhere. Cellular providers using direct to sell will have reciprocal global access in all partner nations. In other words, for carriers who partner in direct to sell, their customers would stay seamlessly connected. In addition to T-Mobile in the US, these carriers include Optus in Australia, Salt in Switzerland, Rogers in Canada, One New Zealand, Entel in Chile and Peru, and KDDI in Japan. As you can tell, this is huge. For those of us who have ever been in a place where you can't get signal, no, it can be super frustrating. Worst case, it can even mean the difference between life or death. In fact, about 90% of the earth remains unreachable by traditional cell signals from any wireless company. These dead zones have serious consequences for remote communities and those who travel and work off the grid. People in those areas are either left disconnected or resort to lugging around a satellite phone, which is incredibly expensive. And pretty heavy. <laughs> Starlink's direct-to-cell service will provide coverage nearly everywhere a customer can see the sky, bringing cell phone connectivity. we have a real chance to bring meaningful connectivity to people who need it most. A little over a year ago with our partner SpaceX, we announced a common vision to put an end to dead zones. This technology did not exist a year ago. With the telecom expertise from T-Mobile combined with the satellite technology from SpaceX, it's, it's reality now. For the first time ever, we will have connectivity regardless of where we are. There's still half a million square miles of this country that aren't covered by any terrestrial network. That means we aren't connecting people in those areas. Nobody's connecting people in those areas. So this is a massive milestone in our journey to bring coverage to areas that have not been possible to cover before. The satellites are flying at 17,000 miles per hour. So you can imagine the challenges of trying to play ping pong as something is moving that fast. 
we will keep on pushing the boundaries of this technology. We will start with messaging and then we'll go from there to look at other opportunities in data and, and voice. That's definitely our goal. The combination of what we're both good at is actually making each of us stronger and creating something together that is unprecedented. The proof is in the pudding only after you've launched them in space. I'm over excited about that. It's going to be a huge moment. Bringing this service to the world is really going to change the trajectory of communications. We're going to finally get towards fulfilling that ultimate mission of connecting our customers everywhere. Go for launch. The first six direct-to-sell satellites we're launching today will be used to test the service in the United States at first. Starlink's direct-to-sell capability will first enable text messaging, and then after more satellites are placed in orbit, voice and data coverage will be enabled. Direct-to-sell will also connect to Internet of Things devices, like those used in remote areas for agriculture, environmental monitoring, and fire detection. Think about the impact on the safety around the globe, like people assisting in emergency situations, like firefighters and rescues along coastal waters. It can also help people like me, who love hiking in national parks and other places where cell phones get no reception. I go there to relax and enjoy nature, so I want to stay offline. But knowing that I can connect in an emergency would provide a peace of mind for both me and my loved ones. So let's talk about how this all works. First, we get those satellites to orbit, and that's what we're doing today. Once on orbit, the satellites will immediately connect to the Starlink constellation to provide global connectivity. direct to cell allows users to seamlessly connect to SpaceX satellites when they enter a remote area that currently has no cell service. It operates just like a mobile phone tower does on the ground, but from space. The service will work with any 4G LTE device, and most current smartphones are already compatible. So that's the latest news on Starlink's newest capability. If you want to stay up to date on direct to cell go to direct.starlink.com. And as we mentioned earlier, to enable direct to cell capability, we're adding new hardware to our Starlink satellites. With any changes to our satellites in orbit, SpaceX works closely with leading astronomers from around the world to better understand if there are any impacts to their observations, because we firmly believe in the importance of a natural night sky for all of us to enjoy. While we do expect these first six Starlink direct to cell satellites to be a bit brighter than previous Starlink V2 minis, we plan to measure the brightness of the six and compare those measurements to our models. We'll then make adjustments to hardware and operations to honor our commitment to making our satellites as dim as possible. Now back to today's launch. We are just about seven minutes from liftoff. So far, everything is proceeding smoothly. We are watching the cumulus clouds overhead and currently 70. Chill has started. 70% go for launch. And while we wait, let's take a closer look at the vehicle on your screen. Falcon 9 is a two-stage rocket, and it also happens to be the first orbital-class rocket capable of reflight. Falcon 9 stands about 230 feet tall, which is almost as tall as the Taj Mahal in India, and it's named after the Millennium Falcon from Star Wars. The first stage, which is the tallest portion of the vehicle, provides 1.7 million pounds of thrust thanks to its nine Merlin M1D engines. And actually, the number nine in Falcon 9 refers to those nine M1D engines on the first stage, but there are actually 10 engines on the rocket. That's right. The second stage has that 10th engine. Stage one, RP1 load is complete. Uh, that 10th engine, which is the Merlin Vacuum or MVAC engine. This engine is similar to a first stage M1D engine, but has more redundancies as well as a larger nozzle that allows the second stage to perform in the vacuum of space. The first stage is what gets us out of the Earth's atmosphere and into space, and the second stage takes all the satellites to their targeted drop-off orbit. Now, on top of the second stage, you'll see that large barrel structure with a pointed nose. That is our payload fairing. It's composed of two halves, each made up of carbon fiber composite material. As a whole, the fairing protects our satellites until we're in the vacuum of space. Around three minutes into flight, once we've exited the atmosphere, we will jettison the fairing halves and attempt to retrieve them once they return to Earth. We want to jettison those fairings as soon as we can because the weight of the fairings actually decrease second stage performance. And for reference, the payload fairing is about 40 feet tall with a 17-foot diameter. So to put that size into perspective, an average fire truck is about 40 feet long and 12 feet wide. So a fire truck would just fill up our payload fairing. 
As the fairing halves return to Earth, so will our first stage, which is set to land on our drone ship. Of course, I still love you. And you can see it there on your screen, stationed out in the Pacific Ocean. Overall, SpaceX has reflown 231 boosters, but tonight Top our tanks are pressurizing for strong back retract. Tonight, our rocket will be making its first flight to space. Now, for those of you who follow along, you'll already know that we typically end our Starlink webcasts following first stage landing and confirmation of a successful MVAC shutdown. Now, for updates on deployment, be sure to check out at SpaceX on X. Now, at this time, as we mentioned before, weather is uh, about 70% chance of go. We have been watching the weather with some wind speeds and cumulus cloud rules. Um, however, we are go for launch at this point in time. And as for the range, uh, range is green and they are ready to support liftoff uh, just uh, four minutes and 10 seconds, uh, almost 10 seconds from now. We can actually see those clamp arms under the fairing uh, have just opened. That's in preparation for strong back retraction. The strong back is also referred to as the TE or transporter erector. That's the large structure that you see there next to Falcon 9. It's now moving away uh, by a couple degrees from the vehicle. And this TE does move away from the vehicle. This is in preparation to clear the pad for liftoff. It's moving a little bit away right now, but at T0 also move a significant amount more away from the vehicle as the vehicle lifts off. And the next milestone coming up once the TE is complete, completely reclined um, for this uh, phase will be at T minus three minutes. That will be liquid oxygen loading complete on the first stage. We are continuing to load locks on the second stage as well, and that will wrap up at the T minus two minute mark. And once we hit that mark, that will complete propellant loading on Falcon 9 altogether. So just a few seconds away from locks loading complete on stage one. Stage one locks load is complete. And there's that call and out. Stage one pogo. Locks loading is complete on the first stage vehicle. That means that the first stage is fully loaded with RP-1 and liquid oxygen. And again, we are waiting liquid oxygen loading completion on the second stage, again, which will wrap up at the T minus two minute mark. Now that locks load is complete on the first stage, we will start to see some of those white clouds form around the vehicle. We'll see more of that occur after locks load completes in about 20 seconds on the second stage. Totally normal. That's just liquid oxygen venting from uh, the lines in the TE. Looking like that second stage locks load should be wrapping up in just a couple of seconds here. As we said before, weather has been a watch item leading up to tonight's launch. But as of right now, we are still go for launch on the weather front. Everything continues nominally with our countdown so far for an on-time launch. Stage two locks load is complete. There we heard that call out, letting us know that Falcon stage two locks load is complete. So at this point in time, Falcon 9 is now fully loaded with all of its propellants. Um, equaling 1 million pounds of liquid fuel and oxygen. Now in about f a few seconds, we'll hear a call out that Falcon 9 is in startup. That means that the onboard flight computers have taken over the launch countdown. Falcon 9 is in startup. All right. Right now, stage one and stage two are beginning to pressurize to their final pressure prior to launch. LD is go for launch. All right, that's the final go needed for tonight's launch coming to us from our launch director. So at this point in time at T minus 35 seconds, all systems are go for liftoff of Falcon 9 with our Starlink satellites, including our first six direct to sell satellites. Let's listen in on the final count. T minus 15 seconds. T minus 10. 
nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, ignition, and lift off the top of nine. Stage one propulsion is nominal. At T plus 33 seconds, you are watching Falcon 9 accelerate our Starlink satellites out into space. We are throttling down our engines on the first stage vehicle, and that is in preparation for max Q. Power and telemetry nominal. Good call outs there. Max Q is the largest amount of stresses that the vehicle sees on ascent, so we do slow the vehicle down just a little bit in preparation for passing through Max Q. And that should be coming up. Supersonic. That should be coming up here in just under 10 seconds. Max Q. Great news, we have passed through Max Q. All right, we're a minute and a half into... Back engine chill has started. Uh, that call there tells us that the engine on the second stage, that MVAC, has begun to flow some super chilled liquid oxygen through the engine to begin to bring that hardware down, uh, down in temperature. We're less than a minute um, away from main engine cutoff, stage separation, second engine start. Those all happen really quickly, so uh, don't blink. <laughs> um, after that, we will jettison the fairings. At this point in time, the first stage is experiencing about 3.3 Gs. Beautiful view there on your screen of the vehicle as it's just lifted off from Vandenberg Space Force Space. It's now able to see that plume beginning to um, deplete as we are prepar preparing for main engine cutoff. Main engine cut off. Stage separation confirmed. All right, as you can see there on your screen, MVAC successful ignition. MVAC ignition there on your right hand side. Uh, and before that, we had uh, first stage engine um, shutdown and engines, or excuse me, stage separation. We can see here on the left hand side of the screen uh, the first stage grid fin starting to deploy. Those help steer the booster back to its precise landing. Fairing separation confirmed. All right, as you heard and just saw, successful fairing separation. That marks the ninth flight for one of those fairing halves and the 11th flight for the other. We, of course, will attempt to recover those fairing halves again to use on a future flight. plus three minutes and 48 seconds into flight. And right now you are looking at a view from the second stage vehicle, looking at our MVAC engine, glowing very brightly there. The first stage is making its way back down to earth right now. Uh, and it does take two burns to make its way back down to our drone ship, which is, of course, I still love you for tonight's scheduled landing. Those two burns coming up will be the entry burn, which is just about a couple minutes away from now, followed by the landing burn. The entry burn is where we reignite three of the nine M1D engines on the vehicle, and that helps slow the stage down as it's re-entering back into the Earth's atmosphere. Then once we shut down those engines to conclude the entry burn, the atmosphere actually scrubs most of the velocity as it's making its way back to its landing zone. And then we use one final burn, a single engine burn. The center E9 engine will reignite and that will help to slow the vehicle down just in time to touch down for landing. 
Again, the entry burn on the first stage is coming up in a little over a minute from now. And though you can't see it on your screen, on the bottom left-hand corner, you could see the telemetry of the Stage 1 vehicle, so you could see its speed and altitude. And for the second stage vehicle, on your right hand, the right bottom corner of your screen is where you can see the telemetry for Stage 2. We're about one minute away from the entry burn on the first stage vehicle. Both vehicles are following a nominal trajectory. And good call-outs there. Both first stage and second stage are following nominal trajectories. Today's mission marks SpaceX's 296th overall launch. And it is the first of 2024. Again, it is carrying our Starlink satellites for this mission, including our first six direct-to-cell satellites. Now that entry burn on the first stage is coming up in just under 20 seconds. There you can see on your left-hand screen is a view from the first stage. stage. entry burn startup. Good timing. We heard that call out. And now you can see on your screen those engines have relit on the first stage vehicle. This is just about a 20-second burn. Stage one entry burn shut down. And there we heard that call out as well. As you can see that the engines have shut down on the first stage vehicle. That concludes the entry burn. The first of two burns that the first stage requires to make its way back to landing. The next burn is the landing burn coming up in just about a minute and a half. Stage one, FTS has saved. Everything continues to look good for uh, both the first and second stage. If you've been following along with that altitude there on the left-hand side of your screen for stage one, uh, it actually kept increasing in altitude until about four and a half minutes, T plus four and a half minutes. As we can see, it's getting closer and closer. We are targeting a landing on our drone ship. Just read the instructions. Or, excuse me, of course, stage I still love you. And there we just heard the call out uh, that the first stage is transonic, telling us that it is traveling near the speed of sound. Now only six kilometers above the uh, ocean. So in about 12 seconds, we should see that landing burn ignite. That's a one engine uh, burn designed to- Day one landing burn. There we heard the call out, so we should see it here. There we go. So the first stage has lit one engine to prepare for a landing. Stage two, FTS has saved. We're targeting a landing on our drone ship, which you there see, deploy. see there now. Of course, I still love you. Stage one landing confirmed. A beautiful nighttime shot there of a successful landing. That is Falcon 9 touching down for the 260th overall successful recovery of an orbital class rocket. And with that successful booster landing, we will wrap up today's launch coverage. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are thrilled to see our first direct to cell satellites launch to orbit today. The first of many that will enable an additional layer of connectivity in areas previously unreachable by traditional cellular networks. For updates on deployment, be sure to check us out at SpaceX on X. A huge thank you to all of our direct to sell partners and thank you to all of you, the viewers. We'll see you back here again soon tomorrow for our second launch of the year of the Avzon 3 mission set to lift off from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida at 6.04 p.m. Eastern time. Happy New Year and we'll see you again soon.